You're watching the Desert Moon Hockey Podcast with Matt and Rich. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 12 of the Desert Moon Hockey Podcast. I am your host, Rich, and my other host, Matt, is on the other side of me. We uh, just want to start off by saying thank you for all of the support on our most recent video about the Arizona Coyotes selling out the arena. We are going to go over a little bit about that uh, shortly, just a quick follow-up. Uh, but before that, let me make sure to say, uh, if you could, please give us a like, a follow, a subscription, uh, or whatever on whatever platform you're listening to. I would really appreciate it. We are a small little community here, but we talk nothing but hockey in the desert, specifically the Arizona desert. So, yeah, uh, that's that's all that's all I'm going to say. And uh, we got a, a couple things here to note. It's a little bit more of a lighter week here, but uh, as I was talking about, we'll talk a little bit, just touch up on the selling out situation. We have a couple of trade proposals that... Uh, We've, we've mocked up here, either uh, Matt, you've asked people, or we've made our own up. Uh, we have a little bit of news about the draft and the draft party, and I think that's it. Or is there one more thing? There's one more well, thing. That should be but about I, it, and okay. unless we're going to praise Shane Doan and make that just a weekly thing where we <laughs> give thanks to our Lord and Savior, the donor. Although, I don't think he'd appreciate that joke very much. He's too pure. He really is. He's a good religious boy. Good old religious guy. <laughs> All right, so I guess we'll start off with just a huge thank you, a shock, a what happened. I know Richie's really good with, with the SEO stuff, but 1.5K views in a day. Actually, on the app it says 1.8, but officially it's 1.5. That's what you guys can see. So 1.5, wow, just how do you feel? How, how do you feel uh, knowing that some, that, that some numbers went towards you there, buddy? Uh, I mean, that's great, and I, I hope that, you know, more of you will hopefully listen to this episode being the next thing on our, that'll get uploaded, and um, I hope you guys stick around, because we're talking nothing but hockey, and we're excited about hockey here in Arizona. I I mean, I'm really happy to see that the uh, the videos are taken off, and I'm I'm excited to keep those numbers going. And I just want to point out, it's funny. We called this, all right, I don't know if we said it specifically in the last video, but we've talked about it many a time, how the narratives are always going to shift. So remember, mm -hmm. going into it, the ticket prices are, oh, they're not even going to be able to sell out 5000 And the ticket prices are revealed. No one's no, going to pay those wait, prices. They, wait, it was <laughs> they weren't even going to sell out the 3200 Remember that. Oh, I, I apologize. Yes, it's 3200 they, they couldn't even sell that out because they're pathetic. Look at these numbers. It's more, you know, it's more expensive than in Vancouver or St. Louis. I'm not, I don't mean to pick on Shannon or uh, any of the guys over, it's just people that, those are the two fan bases that came to mind. Those are the ones that I specifically heard talking about it. Oh, tickets are cheaper there. So, oh, you know, no one's going to pay those prices. Now they sold out four different categories. Oh, well, it's not that hard to sell out 5,000 seats. Yeah, we knew what was going to happen. <laughs> in a month and a half, they've sold that out. Knowing, everybody here in the Arizona knowing that next year is not going to be a good season. Obviously, the, the rebuild is in full rebuild mode. And yet, we're beginning to see season tickets selling out in a month and a half. But, as you were full saying... people seats. Most expensive seats, two weeks. Yep. Two weeks. I had to cut you off there because I just want to put a little period there because I'm like... The narratives are always going to shift. Look, I, I, I need to make a separate video on this, shameless plug. I'm going to say it right here. All right, Coyotes fans, stop engaging with these people. All right, they, they don't know what they're talking about. They they don't want this team to, like, my wife's always confused by it. It's like, oh, don't you, you guys want them to make money or not? They don't. They want to justify the Coyotes leaving. That's it. Yep. They're not arguing in good faith. St don't even try. Just respond, lol. Just ignore them or laugh at them because it, that nothing angers them more than just knowing people don't take them seriously because they're not actually making arguments about the health of the franchise. They want the team in Quebec or Houston or, you know, the, the valleys out there in Kansas City. It, it, they don't really care about the hockey working here. So just yep. there's, there's my little uh, my little soapbox for the day. Yeah, and... Uh... Pretty much all I'm going to wrap it up with saying is just thank you for for giving us some support and viewing our content. That's really incredible stuff. You know, I'm really happy to see that people want to hear us talking Arizona hockey. 
Uh, but yeah, just be careful. People are going to continue to keep shifting the goalposts. That's just the way it is. I, I realized that once I started talking with somebody who is like just being a loser on Twitter, like literally trying to tell me exactly how my airspace works, even though I'm a part 107 pilot. I even, I even flashed the receipts up at him and he's like, oh, I don't believe you. You're not a real pilot. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you called you called the airspace A airspace instead of B airspace. I'm like, whatever, dude. Like, I know what the ground level stuff is. I'm a I'm a freaking drone pilot. I know what the what the perimeter of the airport is. Yes, I mistakenly said A and B, and it just turned into a schizo post. And I was just like, all right, I'm out, and I just deleted everything and blocked him. I'm like, this dude just doesn't want to listen. He's just gonna keep trolling. So that's how you know you won. Just a, yeah. just a comment there. That's how you know you've won is people don't actually respond to the point you made. They'll just like you misspoke one small detail and it's like they'll just harp on that because they have no argument. Again, just laugh at them yep. and move on. That's yep. that's the strategy. The, that is the strat moving forward. <laughs> to give give a little context, he thought that the arena deal, the new Tempe arena deal was terrible and instead of using that landfill site as an arena slash you know multi-purpose area he thought it would be a better idea to take that landfill redo everything you know 140 million dollars worth of of effort and then put an airport right there they With... were having concerns of where to fit i was at the tempe council meeting they were asking hey how come you're not putting in this residential until phase two there's only a little bit of residential going in phase one Gutierrez even said they want to make sure they can fit the arena there first. Yeah. So if it can barely hold an arena and a couple hotels and like an apartment little little building, you're telling me it could hold it? Could it even fit a few aircraft? Like like those smaller like at, at the Glendale Airport or the one over, like, like yeah. Deer Valley Airport? Could it uh, fit those planes? I don't know. But there was so much wrong with it. It was it, like literally melted my brain from having to talk to this person. Not only that, but then you know you also have checkpoints that planes have to abide by to go over the lake. You also had uh, you know housing that was already pre built around that area. If you try to put an airport in, guess what? Those people are going to start suing you for noise complaints. Um, yeah, it was it, it was just dumbfounding. And then he's like, oh, yeah, and it'll just be a part of Sky Harbor. I'm like, you know Sky Harbor is, you know, owned by Phoenix, right? And the land is in Tempe. <laughs> what? Like, and it's, yeah, it was just, it was, it was just brain numbing so uh yeah he didn't understand the concept that you know if the land is owned and there's an airport going in there it would not be a part of sky harbor meaning that it would inflict with sky harbor thus nullifying the land you could not put an airport there uh, it was just it would be more th worthwhile to put like a seaport there and uh, you could only have like kayaks we'll, we'll just lake, we'll so. just have no no, no it'll, it'll be those swans that you can't you push <laughs> with your feet that's what it'll be you know what? No Tempe <laughs> Arena. Just freeze the water in Tempe Town Lake. Put some bleachers on either end and just have them skate there. There you go. I like that idea. <laughs> anyway, all right. Let's move on so before yep. we, we take up 25 minutes. So the draft party. Yes. Upcoming draft party. Wild Horse Pass, correct? Yes, sure. I think it was Wild Horse Pass. It, uh, go go look at the Coyote Twitter. We're going to be going to the Coyotes one. I know there's a couple of draft parties. I know PHNX is throwing a draft party at four peaks but i will not be able to attend that because unfortunately i already committed to the coyotes one so i'm most likely going to be there as long as work does not take me out um obviously being weekday uh my schedule is kind of up in the air until like a week before but uh if we are there i would love to see you if you if you notice us and you want to say hello come and say hello to us because you're you're showing up right well, I'm looking at it right now, so I haven't finalized my new work schedule. It's looking like I, I have Sunday, Monday, and then Wednesday off. I can mm. probably just swap Wednesday and Thursday and make sure I go. It's on, on Thursday, July 7th. So I, I'll probably find a, an excuse to go, Yeah. Uh, especially if you commit as well, so I'll have people to talk to, and then I might I might do some light gambling because I get bored. Yeah, as, <laughs> as long as we – as long as, like, I've got – clearance like a week before i'll try to make sure to let you know and let 
maybe tweet it out or something that, you know, that I'll be attending. So, yeah, and that'll be fun. I mean, that's our Super Bowl, right? That's that's our Stanley Cup is is the draft party for this team. So don't miss it. Please show up. Please be there. It's going to be a good time. They always are. I've been to four of them, three or four of them. I was Barrett Hayden, Clayton Keller, and the Dylan Strom one. So I think three. The Dylan Strom one was really cool. That was at Gila River, and then they had the uh, Roger Klein and the Peacemakers play afterwards. That was actually a lot of fun. Hopefully they do something like that. I would love to see Roger Klein play again. He's always a good time. I just want them to play the refreshments and not a single person watching this knows who that is. I don't even know who they are. It's a stupid Arizona fan that my dad liked. Anyway, <laughs> so while we're talking about the draft, and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and just be coy once more with a little shameless plugging. I would like to do a little video eventually that kind of compares Quebec and Arizona with the whole Blake Wheeler situation. Yeah. And some of these proposals, a couple of them involve the Coyotes trading up to the first overall pick. And one of your biggest concerns had to kind of loosely tie in with Blake Wheeler. Yep. So do you want to start off with that, kind of talking about why we don't personally expect the Coyotes to move up to number one? If anything, they would try to go up to number two to lock down Logan Cooley. Yes. But that's only if they genuinely uh, – all the reports right now are suggesting New Jersey takes Slavkovsky. But if they felt they weren't and they wanted to lock down Cooley, that's the most I'm, I'm personally going to predict. Yeah, I think so. I think – sorry, I was burping there. I think <laughs> that that would be a really good idea. Um, as you were talking about with the Blake Wheeler situation, I do suspect some Blake Wheeler vibes coming from Shane Wright. Uh, we've heard a little bit of rumblings deep within the eternal core. Uh, nothing solidified, nothing serious, just little baby rumblings about how it doesn't seem like Shane Wright is very interested in going to Arizona. And him being a Canadian-born citizen, that does not surprise me. As Canadians hate Canada, or sorry, yeah, well, they do hate Canada, but <laughs> they hate Arizona more. And... Uh, so it would not surprise me. I know there are, are plenty of Canadians who do love Arizona. I want you <laughs> I want you to know that. I'm just I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's just your media just is cynical. extremely We're toxic. Just having fun. <laughs> yeah, you're you you know and I know that Leafsnet is very toxic to Arizona, okay? So and it, And as for sorry, what? I was just going to say you you looked a little confused there. I was going to say that's Sportsnet's, but we all know it's Leafsnet. <laughs> Dude, everything in Canada is just covering the Leafs, even if it's supposed to be covering something else. But just, I full disclosure, take this with a huge grain of salt, because I'm not allowed to disclose who I heard this from, but one person that I do know very well who was involved with the organization that Shane Wright w was currently playing for, uh, I can at least, at the, at the very least, say I know where he wants to go. I don't want to give that info out, but uh, he has no interest in Arizona. And Logan Cooley has already made public statements that he's interested in what's going on over here. So even if Shane Wright is the better player, which I think Shane Wright's going to be a better all-around player, I think I agree with you, Cooley probably has that higher potential like offensively, which we could really use. Uh, if I'm going to go for one, I'm going to go for the player that has already showed interest. Even if he's lying, he's at least willing to say the right things, as opposed to someone who, like I said, great assault, no interest in Arizona whatsoever, does not want to, to come yeah. here. So I, if they do anything, it would be a pick swap with New Jersey. I don't know how... You work with that. There's a you could probably throw like Krauser in, depending on who you're swapping around. It's, it's not really important now. Just that's the max I'm, I'm going to see them moving up. Though I would not mind a little 4D chess. We'll, we'll go ahead and just kind of skip over this part of the proposal. If they do get first overall, you then flip that to get like fifth and eighth or or whatever. Like you try to get two more picks around the top. 10 to 13 or so so you just basically like double what you would have gotten it's still risky to do that but that's the only way i can see them going for first overall and it might just not be worth the 4d chess and the amount of assets changing hands to try to pull it off yeah i don't i don't see that happening it we these are great 4d chess moves but we've never <laughs> seen like these 4d chess moves actually play out <laughs> like th there's there's only a few times where it actually happens and that's when uh, my, that's when Mike Hoffman's going to San Jose, and then ten minutes later, he's uh, he ends up in uh, 
what was it st louis or or uh no florida florida Florida, that's what yeah (laughs) ends up in florida goes uh, the san jose shark great mike hoffman you know that's that's some 40 chess stuff but yeah i i think there is a real possibility that we could see uh the coyotes try to trade at least either a pick swap from second to third or even pick up the second overall pick uh just straight up you know with assets going the other way uh one that i've proposed i don't know how much i would put into this but it was something interesting was like do you do you move jacob chikrin and maybe lawson kraus to new jersey for the second overall pick and then maybe one or two assets uh with new jersey coming the other way because uh, the, the biggest criticism that New Jersey's faced in the offseason from the media has been that they need something big physical on the wing to do to help out the flashy young kids that are down the center, the, the center depth there. So, you know, look, that's why Slavkoski has projected to go so high and why he's projected to go so, second overall. But, um, you know, Boston Krause is a very formidable opponent on that wing um led the hit let the lead hits what a few years back he led all all uh nhlers and hits you know he's consistently one of those guys that's like a top 10 hitter in the league makes sense it would uh just side note uh that's we're gonna be talking more about Lawson and kraus later but definitely if uh, I wouldn't mind them trying to get, like, Mercer as, like, a secondary asset. I don't know how likely that would be. You could yeah. comment if you choose to, but uh, that's what I would be personally looking at if you're going to get rid of Kraus because the, the way I see it, nothing against Jacob Chikrin. He's a great player. He's already one and a half feet outside of the door. It's not like a, you know, go F yourself. It's a, okay, I've already accepted a, a divorce is coming, so, like, yeah. If we can move you for something that's advantageous, I'm perfectly okay with that. Like it's, yeah. I've accepted it. I'm at the you know the part of acceptance. So that's if, if we sound you know cold, it's nothing against Chikrin. I love yeah. Chikrin as a player. And if he nothing comes back next year, person. if he comes back next year, I'll be perfectly happy with him coming back. Let me be really uh-huh. clear with that. I don't think personally he'll be too happy with that. Um, but he has shown himself to be a professional, and he's not willing to. Um, go full toxicity but um yeah i i I think that this year this off season's the right time to mutually part ways have a mutual breakup with jacob chikrin and uh if if lost and kraus were to go as well in in a deal like that i really do believe because i know last week we talked about potentially with two and three going like cooley and maybe the the, one of the Mm d-men excuse me if uh, Kraus goes, I could very much see them picking up uh, Slavkovsky with one of those two as well. So it'd be like a coolie Slavkovsky. Because then you're, you know, Kraus goes in, you bring in the younger Kraus essentially back in. And that, that increases your timeline for your playoff windows uh, further down the line and stuff like that. Longer that you can keep him with RFA years and stuff. Unless you foresee some major rebound by Christian Fisher... Or you think Ben McCartney is ready, which I don't think Ben McCartney is ready yet. But I'm saying, like, unless yeah. you're thinking about it that way, then they can go for for Nemec or they can go for uh, I, I, That's I true. keep forgetting the other other kid's name. Your check to your check just to kind of cover all the bases. But I I think that would actually be pretty smart because it, getting Cooley and Slavkovsky, you can even throw them on a line together. I don't care who's on the right wing there, uh, Gunner maybe if Gunner ends up you know coming up next year. I I'd still think. Gunther would be at least one more year away. He'd be AHL eligible next year, right? Or Gunner? It's, it's, no. It's Gunner like one more year for AHL. Yeah, Gunner is one more year until he can go in the AHL. So it's either he comes up full time, or after nine games they send him back to juniors. I would like to see him play five, seven, eight games to start the year. If his training camp is as is better than it was last year, I thought he played really well at training camp last year. If it's around there, if not a little bit better, I wouldn't mind seeing him start, but just then let him go back to juniors after. It's just, hey, now you know what to expect. Now you know what you need to work on for the rest of the juniors here. Uh, go dominate. Yeah. Anyway, without clogging up any more time, would you like to get into some of the trade proposals? Yes, I would love to 
rip my hair out with some trade repo- proposals here. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to start off with the non-proposal. It was a Winnipeg Jets fan saying he doesn't have a proposal, but their GM needs to be on the phones. I wouldn't mind Kyle Connor and or Josh Morrissey if, if you want to send one of those oh, two I've, assets my way. <laughs> I love Kyle Connor, but there's no way in hell they're yeah, sending no a Ky- there there's no way in hell they're sending <laughs> Kyle Connor. <laughs> Would you take Josh Morrissey and some assets, though? Unfortunately, Andrew Kopp, they already traded him away. I, w- I yep. would have loved if they if Kopp would have still been available there so you can get, like, Morrissey, Kopp, and, like, a younger asset. Because, like, Morrissey's also the type of guy, like, right around the same age where you can build with him if you can get him to want to stay and really buy in. And then Andrew Kopp is a phenomenal bottom sixer. That I'd, It's good to see him getting some credit over there in New, Jer- or, uh, New York. New York, recognition. Yeah. That's hard because I like Morrissey, but he's also 27, right? Which is a little bit of a problem. You're you're pushing your ages out. And I think that if you're going to be bringing on any assets that aren't drafted by you, I think that they are going to have to be about 23 and younger, if I had to guess. Uh, so that's one of those things where I would probably say no to that. All right, next trade proposal I already know your opinion on this one, but I thought it'd be funny to throw it out anyway. It's with St. Louis. It's Chikrin for Pareko, Huso, and a second round pick. So I'm I'm not terribly hating that deal. I think that once again Pareko being um older doesn't help, but you also have Pareko signed up for a long time. Um I don't think the second's enough. I it would have to be a first. Um whether that's this year or next year or whenever. Uh, as for Vili Husso, I I like Husso. He's not a bad player by any means. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's one of those things where the pot needs to be sweetened a little bit more, you know. Um, it just depends. Really does. Also, Husso... I was, I was going to finish, finish up here real quick. Uh, Husso is a... Uh, UFA as well so uh, the value there is going to be very low unless you it's a sign and trade sort of thing and honestly I have no interest anyway Huso's good he's probably going to be a career backup if not a Louis Domingue-esque fringe starter that your window of him starting is going to be shockingly small we see it all the time the backups will rise and then also immediately crash or they'll have a couple mediocre years or like Louis Domingue, you will lead a trash team to a pretty decent record and then get thrown away the next season. Yeah, uh, that's but just a little, at little, the same uh, me there. <laughs> same time, the Blues weren't a trash team this year, and I thought he played quite well. He had uh, 40 starts, um, with a uh, a point nine 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 one nine uh, save percentage. So pretty good, you know. If you if you know goalie stats, it's that's pretty solid. Uh, yeah. It just depends, like. With him being a UFA, he could probably just skedaddle. So it definitely feels like uh, you would have to put some serious uh, assets back in that pool. You know, with that first, maybe even something else if if the Huso signing isn't immediate. Screw it. The real deal, James Neal, and we'll take it. True. <laughs> anyway. All right. This next one, we already kind of talked about the, the Montreal... Uh, the Montreal one, we're going to skip over oh, wait, that wait. one. Wait, sorry. Okay, uh, about the Blues, I forgot about this player. Logan Brown is on that team. Logan Brown and Clayton Keller are good buddies. They're best buddies. I'm I'm all for team buddies. Let's bring team buddies in. That's also going to be a, a, a pretty big uh, theme throughout. <laughs> I like how you brought that up. So we're going to go over, we're going to skip over that first Montreal deal. Here's the second one. It's Chikrin and the third overall for Goulet in the first overall. I know you have opinions on uh, on Caden Goulet. Would you like to start this one off? So I like Caden Goulet. Um, I had to get in an argument on Discord with somebody about it because they just told me he's trash, he's trash, he's trash, and didn't actually, you know, give any supplemental information about why he's trash or their opinion of why he's trash. Uh, I like him a lot. I, I think that his toolbox and his toolkit is very very good the only problem is that he's in the canadian junior leagues where it is a bit of a mess if you're playing defense 
Uh, that's not to say that all defensemen just come out flawed out of the Canadian Junior Leagues. Um, by no means am I saying that. Uh, but the tools there look really good. The biggest thing that he has knock for is uh, understanding his spatial awareness with attackers. And also another one that I looked at uh, personally was that his recognition of um, taking the right line once he's been beat back to the goaltender. Uh, you know, a lot of D-men, unfortunately, suffer from puck watching and will either follow the play or do something mistakenly and that's that's his biggest knocks i think you can fix that it's nothing mechanical it's nothing between the ears it's just learning it's also dylan gunther's teammate just to tie right back into true to keeping teammates together as on top of that uh, uh, to finish up though um would i do that no i don't think so i think that if you're looking at what bill armstrong's trying to do value wise I don't think that's enough value, uh, personally speaking. I th I'm most of the value. Uh, I also kind of highlighted it in the in my video where I think the it's astronomical to astronomically important to be able to control who you're picking, especially if if like a lot of the fans seem to have already locked on Logan Cooley. I'm going to assume that the franchise and GMBA are also on the same page just for this line of thought. It's invaluable to be able to just straight up choose who you want not have to worry about any external uh any 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 external assets or external reasons so i wouldn't mind uh the concept of it i just feel like while i can see a lot of value in it and while personally i would jump at the chance uh to to have that kind of control and get ghoulie in here i also kind of feel like it would now that i have a second person in here also scrutinizing stuff to give a second opinion probably wouldn't end up being worth it as even though i like the deal yeah yeah i i agree i think that if if cooley is there at three uh the difference between cooley and Wright isn't enough to to justify uh giving up essentially jacob chikrin a jacob chikrin caden Cooley swap um i just don't i don't think there's enough there i think that uh I think I said Cooley. I meant Caden Gooley. That's that's a tough <laughs> one there. Uh, a Caden a Caden Gooley Jacob Chikrin swap. Um, I think Cooley and Wright are pretty close. And if it's like a worst case scenario, I still don't think Slavkovsky's terrible. It's it just we'd have our our hopes on a center. We'd be getting a winger who allegedly can play some center, but we're judging him as a winger. Yeah. So I, just, I, I can also, in that scenario, with more time, I can also see him looking at Nemec uh, if it was just Slavkovsky available, just depending on how, how they addressed it and what other trades may or may not have been made at that point. Now, yeah. the next move has to do with the Rangers. I like this one. I, I like this one a lot. So it's Chikrin and a 2023 third to New York in exchange for Kapokalko, Kravstov, and a 2023 first. You have the floor, sir. Um, yeah, I like that deal a lot. I think that we would absolutely take that. I like, I'm all for that, that, that deal. Um, I don't believe Capo Caco is a center, right? So you wouldn't be oh, getting a center. Wingers. Yeah, they're both wingers. So I, that's what I was thinking. Kratsov was the one who didn't, uh, show up, right? He was, he was having problems if my memory serves me. Um, I think they wanted him to go to the minors so they didn't have a roster space for him. Yeah. So he only then, played in like 20 games in 2020, 2021. He didn't play for yeah, like the NHL level this he, year. He went back to either the KHL or one of the European leagues. Um, I don't know too much about Kratsov. I've seen some of the highlights that he was pulling off when I think it was the KHL. Um, I like the idea. I think that it would be worth it to me to give it a shot. Um, I it is magic beans. It is a little bit magic beans, uh, but Kako I know is a good player. I watched him in the scouting years. I really liked Kako. I thought he could have gone uh, first overall over Lafreniere, not Lafreniere. Um, Jack Hughes that year, I believe. Jack Hughes. I thought he could have gone uh, first overall over uh, Jack Hughes, uh, just specifically one to one. But obviously, Jack Hughes uh, being a center was much more valuable, and I. 
looks like the right pick so far, obviously, numbers-wise. But also, uh, something to keep in mind is that the Rangers, historically, have been terrible at developing uh, young assets. They, I don't know what it is about that organization, but if you look at some of the best assets they've had, it comes in via free agency, trade, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, I'd be open to that. I'd be really open to take a chance on those two wingers and then also still having the first overall, which would be what? Uh, oh, wait, no, that, that was next year's, 2023, yeah, right? Yeah, it's next year's pick, so it can be anywhere between, okay. realistically speaking, 15 and 28. Just yeah. depending on if there's a, a big, you know, up or, or downswing for them. And honestly, the main reasons I love this this concept, so obviously I, I did write down everyone's stats. So you can bring up, you know, Kraftsoft's ninth overall in 2018, uh, 20 games, two goals, two assists, four points. Two years ago when he played, it, same, same thing with kind of Capocacco and Lafreniere. It took him a couple of years to really get his stride because New York simply does not have the, the consistent minutes and spot for him because you're not going to play Kako or Lafreniere on that first line, on that wing, because that's Pernarin's line. Uh, the second line is kind of iffy. Sometimes he's playing second, third. Then his rookie year, Laffey was playing on the fourth line for, for a decent portion. So it's New York does not need these two wingers, but if you put them in a consistent top nine, it would be top six, but top nine role, and, and you pair him with Jack McBain, uh, Barrett Hayden, give Barrett Hayden some pretty solid scoring wingers, uh, you pair him with Nathan Smith, all these good young players. Worst case scenario, Kraftstoff just got a one-year extension. I think Kako's up in one more year, so uh, you can extend Kako and then sign and trade him next offseason or try to sign and trade uh, – sorry, sorry. Try to sign and trade Kraftstoff, and you can try to get out from one of them, and you at least have that first-round pick, and you are like, hey, we're going to try to bring in some elite-level like young talent. I, if, I, I see so many positives there. If I was – Going safe, I would still take Kratzov out and try to to st uh, steal Othman from them if they can. But that is th my personal opinion. I have I'm pretty high on Othman uh, down in the OHL. Sticking in New York, I, you didn't sound like you were too big of a, of a fan of this one. So this was allegedly a rumored deal between the or a rumored offer or proposal between the Islanders and Coyotes. So it's Chikrin for Beauvillier, Robin Salo, Atu Ratu, and a first-round pick. So if it was the first-round pick this year, that's actually not terrible because I'm pretty sure it's a little bit higher for them. I think they're sub-10. I don't remember. I'd have to go back. And I know look. they're at least not the very top or the very bottom. I think they're somewhere yeah. closer to the middle. I'm, I'm not super high on Beauvillier. I know some people really like him. Um, I don't know. I, there's some things about his game that worry me a little bit, uh, to being somebody that would be effective here in Arizona. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things. I know that you also like Atu Ratu and I'm not super big on Atu Ratu either. My biggest thing with Ratu, obviously we, we drafted his brother a couple of years ago. Uh, he has yet to sign his ELC. That could change. You can have both of them play in the AHL, get some time together. Tucson can really use some extra talent down there. But he's also projected, the re main reason he lost so much draft stock is he's developed more of a two-way game, probably at max third-line center, 30, 35 points a year. But with better overall defending, he could still be an elite uh, like level defender, good two-way player. I see a tremendous amount of value in that, and I would like to have that on the team, plus that first-round pick. And Mobilier, I just like Mobilier. I thought he was a center. Apparently, he's, he's a wing, or at least listed as wing. But uh, I like Mobilier. I know you have a lot of problems with his, with his game. I still think, worst-case scenario, you can still try to flip him and, and get some younger assets from another team that could use it. So no yeah. matter what, I see the value here. But... Well, I, again, in isolation, whenever I say I'd accept, I'm talking about in isolation, not in a bidding war. Even though I'd say yes to this deal, uh, I can also completely understand the perspective of try to get a little more or just kind of walk away. And I have no opinion on Robin Salo. N none. He can be great. He can be yeah. terrible. I have no opinion. I don't know too much about him, so it's not really a name that I've, I've uh, followed up on. You ready for Toronto? <laughs> oh god all right no. <laughs> chicken <laughs> to toronto for two firsts 
Rasmus Sandin, SDA, and uh, Alex Kerfoot, who is coming off a career year. Uh, okay, so... Now the more I think about it, those firsts are going to be worth a lot more because they'll never make it out of the first round. Um, <laughs> so... Those picks being sub twenty is actually I didn't I didn't project that one. <laughs> I can't keep up with the gag. <laughs> um, it, it's a maybe, right? It, it's a maybe to me. So like I think two first to them is too much because they have a lot more value in their first until they make it deeper. Uh, if you're like a Florida Panthers, your first aren't worth nearly as much. Hence why you pick up. Uh, what was it, Hagel with your first or one of them? Uh, I don't know. But, uh, you know, the Florida Panthers traded away their, their first because they expected to go deeper. Um, yeah, I I don't know. Like, I know some people are high on Sandine. I, I'm i still kind of like, eh. Like, is, is it, is it Nicholas Jalmerson or is it Luke Shen, right? Like... <laughs> Because that's a big difference to me. I, I so. think one thing I, I I like Sandine because essentially he's limited minutes or limited games, fifty one games, five goals, eleven assists, sixteen points. He's not going to be a big offensive producer, which to me is fine. If guys like Habibianko can step up, other young defense make can step up. It, you don't need that. But a mm-hmm. plus nine, I think there is like two pl- positive plus minus players in the Coyotes all of last year. Note that could be uh, slightly or greatly affected by the team he was playing on, not necessarily his talent. But I think there's enough there to to justify looking into it and that being potentially a solid addition. Kerfoot, what one year left on his deal? I would just try to. Now that Probably. I'm thinking about it more, try to put him in the top nine to, to see if his value goes up and flip him at the deadline. Yeah. SCA, I think he's a solid young player at the very least, can make Tucson better. And then, of course, having those two first, I would take it because there's, again, I'm I'm looking at these deals as how many quality young assets are you getting? And then on top of that, with guys like Bovillier and uh, Kerfoot in hindsight, what can you flip them for? Yeah. So it's like, it's as long as it forwards... This youth movement, it gives us higher quality assets. And again, in two years, let's say they're, they are a, now a competitive playoff team in two years. It's a, it's a quicker rebuild. We have all these assets. Okay. Other teams that are also looking to get younger, well, we can trade some of those assets for a good veteran that would help us now. Or we can trade them for this or that that would help us now. Or in five years, we can still have all these assets and still do the same thing. So it's getting more assets, it's a, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. Even if it's all 32 seventh round picks. <laughs> uh yeah i mean i i don't know too much about sda so i i'm not going to comment too much but as for like a kerfoot sandine and two first thing uh i i think the value's there for sure um it's just is it here's all my garbage to make the value there or is it here's all my valuable stuff you know some of my valuable assets right like that's what you got to ask yourself um yeah i i i definitely think that the value is reached it's not like a touch you know give me a give me a, a smidge more i don't think it's that i think that the value meter is has hit for me in my head but the uh is it stuff that makes makes a difference to your club I don't know. I don't mind some potential. Uh, no disrespect to Kerfoot again, coming off a career year. I don't trust career years. I, I just I don't. And then uh, next year going a into a contract year. <laughs> yep. So it's I, I that's why I do not trust career years, especially if they line up within a year of a contract year or on the year. But even if it is just our trash, well, we had Jay Beagle and we had Anton Roussel. If we only have to deal with it for a year, maybe two, I can suck it up because it's a it's a small price to pay for look at these nice shiny young assets. Especially if Toronto thinks this is gonna make them better for deeper runs, they're willing to give up those picks, and then they still don't make those deeper runs value in those first round picks. Yeah. Next up, staying in Canada, I am assuming I yeah, this is going westward. Edmonton. It's a Jacob Chikrin and a conditional third, twenty twenty four. That's if the two first are uh Better than 25th overall, the third is included. If not, uh, the third goes away. Okay. For 2023 and 2024 first, 
Broberg, Clefbaum, and Cassian. Okay, so the problem I have with this one is that I'm not super high on Bro Broberg, as some people are. Um, Clefbaum has been obviously injured for a long time, and if he does come off of that injury, then cool. Maybe you'd be able to flip him with this being his final year. Most likely not. Um, this is tough. So it's essentially the way I put this up in my head is Chikrin or two firsts and Broberg. And then, like, I just don't know how that works because Cassian, they have to get rid of and, and, um, uh, Clef bomb. Clef bomb. I want to say I want to say Klingberg. I, I always mix up <laughs> Klingberg and Clef bomb. Um Those two are assets that have to go because they need the cap space, which is interesting to me because do you let them out? You know, or do you or do you you know put them over a barrel, hypothetically speaking? Because remember, if we want to put in some comp comparisons. Patrick Marlowe, who was like five or six million dollars, was traded to uh, Carolina for a first round pick, which ended up turning into being, I think, Seth Jarvis. Oops. Uh, that's a pretty good pick. Um, you know, with that being said, Cassian and Clefbaum add up to what seven million, roughly seven million in cap space coming off the books. Um, well, then Cassian is three, right? Yeah, yeah, and and Clefbaum is is four. But obviously, that being said, does Clefbaum ever come back, or does he go on LTIR? So, you know, we can we can question this. I would say no to this deal. I think that you can get more. Uh, unless you, you sweeten it up a little bit more, I would say no, because cap space is going to be invaluable this year. I think that a lot of teams are going to need it because they have RFAs and UFAs that need need to be resigned. There are also a lot of teams that want to go after said UFAs that are not being resigned. So I don't think it's one of uh, it's one of those things where it'll have to be a balancing act and it'll have to be just right. Um I don't think you're going to weaponize your cap space to the point where it's just no longer valuable to the uh, to teams because they won't take it. They they won't do the deals. We we saw this with Seattle. They tried to weaponize their cap space, and Bill Armstrong came walking in and going, second round pick, second round pick, second round pick, <laughs> second round pick. Right. So, <clears throat> I don't think you're going to see a lot of putting a team over the barrel, hypothetically speaking, for. For picks like specifically first i don't think just to give it, uh, an example here i know i'm filibustering a bit here <laughs> i want to toss it back over to you um <laughs> i don't think we're going to see like for instance uh the we we linked uh dadanov in vegas to the coyotes for a first i don't think that happens i don't think that general managers are going to be giving up first to free up cap space this year um like we did with uh the Carolina and Leaf Steel for um, Patrick Marlowe. So I would say if you add in maybe like another second, I could see that going through. Uh, I was just gonna say they'll give up a prospect that they don't uh, they don't see as being a top sixer, and then it'll turn into a top six somewhere else and still make them look silly. But I, I was thinking a second round pick, but. The reason I I'm, I was okay with the value, and I, I would still consider it, is because Clefbaum, worst case scenario, that's going on LTIR, meaning it's essentially like you never got the contract, you're just having the insurance pay, pay on the contract, so you can still weaponize that same amount of cap space. The problem is, you have to be 100% sure he's not going to play if you're going to, if, if you are just going to say, hey, we'll take it, but just to have it on the books, because yep. if you look at what Buffalo just did, oh, well... You know, in Buffalo seventh round pick, Buffalo wanted to get to the cap floor, so yeah. that's why that's why it was so low. Because hey, we'll take that contract off. We're not going to put him on LTIR. So if Clefbaum is going on LTIR, I think the value is fine. If Clefbaum is not, I can see what your point being like, hey, throw in an extra second or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know anything about other prospects in Edmonton, but just so we are not running over, one final trade. 
Okay. I like this one. Uh, if I had to choose, like, what gun to my head, pick one of these deals, I'm, I'm picking this one for a couple of reasons. Anyway, so it's Chikrin, Fisher, and a 2024 fourth to Calgary. For a 2023 and 2024 first, Sean Monahan, Milan Lucic, and Matt Coronado. And because of some of some uh, disagreements in that Twitter thread with two, that user and someone else, he also threw in another 2023 pick, I'm going to assume third round, and then Connor Zary. And I ve- I'm pretty high on Connor Zary. So I'm like, I look at that huge deal. Coronado, for context, was a teammate with uh, Josh Doan, that Chicago Steel team that I think they won their championship for 85 points in 51 games. And then this year in Harvard, 34 games, 18 goals, 18 assists, 36 points, maintaining above a point a game at every level so far. At least these last major couple of levels, continuity with Joshua Doan. Uh, whenever donor's ready to come out of college, maybe he will as well. They can both go to Tucson for a year. Maybe they both play in the NHL. I don't know where you fit Coronado specifically. It depends on how the roster is constructed. I see a lot of value there. And Sean Monahan might be on LTIR because of that yeah. hip surgery. I think he's a good player. He's had some struggles. I'm not going to try to defend the struggles. I just, I'm going to look at his talent. I think he's good. If he ends up playing, he could, with a higher role on this team, a lower pressure situation, whatever, could increase his value at the deadline and get you even more young assets and value, and all you got to do is suck up. I think it's one year of Lucic, and if they time the deal right, they only have to pay that $1 million base salary. It just depends on when the signing bonus is paid out. I think that's after free agency. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but it depends on when they make this deal. There is almost no risk here. It's just, hey, Lou teaches on your fourth line for a year. Yeah, um, I would say yes to this as well. I think that you get Coronado, you get... I, I think Zary's, Zary is an overpayment at that point. I think that you, you can't say no if, if Zary's added. Uh, you said two firsts, right? So 2023, uh-huh. 2024. Um, sorry, I'm trying to re- go back over this in my head. It was 2023, 2024... Zary, Coronado, probably third round pick. Okay. So you know all the assets, all the young assets. Okay. And then it was Chikrin, Fisher, and a potential third, right? Potential fourth in 2024. And then it's just one year of each, Lucic and Monaghan, and okay, Monaghan might go LTIR. Yeah, I would say yes to this. I think that that gives you the value that you're looking for for uh chikrin with uh coronado and the two firsts i think three three first round assets was the asking price i think that that suffices it and then uh zuri uh and a potential uh third uh for lucic and monahan monahan potentially going to ltir i think that makes a lot of sense and uh, and even more so is that uh, the Coyotes will have uh, two more buyouts or uh, what the, the little thing of three. I, I always forget what it's called. It's not buyouts. Retainment the, slots, right? Retainment, retainment slots, retainment yes. Slots. So you'll have retainment slots. I could see Lucic going at the deadline with 50% retained to something somewhere who wants a bruiser. Right, two two million or 2.5 million. You get like a fourth, fifth, sixth, somewhere in there. You know, you can flip him at the trade deadline. Um, as for Monahan, I don't think he'll ever play, uh, but maybe, maybe he does. Andrew Ladd was playing on the Coyotes. Like, remember the, that was a serious injury that he recovered from. Uh, Shane Goss despair was told that he was done and he'll he, he's not playing in Philly anymore, and then he put up fifty points in the Coyotes uniform. So and that also more we, than any Philly defenseman, ironically. I, yeah, uh huh. <laughs> ironically, it was more points than any Philly defenseman this year. Um, so, yeah, I could see this trade happening, and I would be happy with this trade for sure. I agree with you. And now, finally, to get us out of the draft and Chikrin and all this, I want to talk about Krauser because okay. I am start right now. I, you kind of rationalize and calm me down a little bit, but. I'm starting to see a, a little bit of a worrying sign. Uh, mm-hmm. Bill Armstrong, unlike with unlike with Connor Garland, Bill Armstrong has already said that's their next priority. They're already looking into extending 
uh, Lawson Krauss. That was, what, a month and a half ago when he made that statement, and nothing's really been done since. And the Coyotes aren't a team that are up towards, you know, the cap ceiling or anything. Yeah, so it's why? not like, you know, they have to carefully plan out their, their cap right now. So I'm like, is it possible that he has interest, but he's also shopping Krauser or looking to see if Krauser could be a sweetener for a bigger deal, maybe involving Chicker, maybe maybe not, to get other younger assets in here first, whatever. Uh, yeah. d- like we mentioned with that, that New Jersey deal, do you think they are, like you pointed out before recording, waiting until after the draft so they can see what they're doing with their cap? Yes. Or do you think they're potentially shopping? I think that they're waiting to see what to do both, actually. I think that if you're a general manager, you're not doing your job if you're not taking calls on players. I think Kraus is shown to be uh, worth taking a look at if you're another general manager. 20-goal season. Sorry about that. 20-goal uh, season and always physical. Top top five, top ten in hits in the NHL. Uh, he is what a lot of people like. He's fast, too. He's Pretty good hands. I wouldn't say he's got great hands, uh, but he's somebody that can blow you by just by a shot. So it's it's good enough. Um, yeah, I think that if I was a betting man, we haven't seen a contract get laid out yet in front of his table, Krause's table, uh, because they're waiting to see how it looks after post deadline or sorry, uh, bo- post draft. Um, that would be my guess. I just hope that he's been transparent with Kraus, uh, because as we saw with the Connor Garland ordeal, I was. If you want to talk about things to criticize the Coyotes for, I don't think that's a really cool thing to do by t- not telling a player that you're you you have no interest in resigning him. Uh, to give context to this, uh, Connor Garland had a pretty good year uh, after taking a very team friendly contract and was looking for an upgrade. And he threw a proposal to to Bill Armstrong and got ghosted, uh, pretty much. And he, you know, explained his disinterest in the media about how he was unhappy about that. And I think that's fair criticism. I think that that's you don't do that. Like if you're if you're looking to trading a player, be honest with them. Like it is your job as general manager to trade players or resign them. So tell them, hey. I, I'll be honest with you, I like you as a player, but we're interested in trading maybe uh, you in a potential package or trading you with somebody, or we're looking at just trading you. I wouldn't even say packaging them. Just say we're looking at potential trades, uh, and we need to go, you know, dot our T's and cross our I's, or I think I said that backwards, whatever. <laughs> I, you know, be honest with players, and and I, I really I don't like the ghosting thing. So I hope that Kraus isn't getting ghosted as well. Um, I'd be very disappointed because Kraus has shown that he loves it here and he wants to be here. And realistically, I hope he doesn't get traded. I, I think if you want to talk about captaincies, I think that Kraus or Keller could be the next captain of this team. Um. I truly do believe that. I think that they are both good people, and they show that leadership potential. Especially with with Clayton Keller's just emotional speech at the at the city yeah. council meeting. I again, it's always just play. It's always just playing around. It's never, it's never actually like we, we like we dislike Clayton Keller. He's a very very good player. I just always think it's it's. I always liked Keller. Guys I'm gonna pound the table here. <laughs> I said it when when Matt put out his hit piece on Keller a few years back. <laughs> <laughs> I pounded the table for Keller. I I believed in him. I just didn't believe in the coach, and I was right. <laughs> so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> if you want context for there, I I saw him as being very overrated, and uh, I made a video called Clayton Keller is overrated, and. Uh, well, within a, a year, year and a half, I had to make a follow-up saying Clayton Keller has figured it out because he, it, it took a little bit, and I, I'm going to have to agree, I was maybe putting a little bit too much blame on player over coach. I was, I think I was bitter because Dylan Strom was playing so much better, and he got all the blame from the fans, so I don't know yeah. if, if that has something to do with it. I agree but with that. He, 
He's taken every little thing he's needed to work on. Two-way game. He's getting involved in defense. He's borderline underrated, borderline elite stick checking. Like, just just yep. speedy stick checking. Uh, his hands have gotten better. His shot, his speed, it, a hockey IQ. I think he, he's even skating faster. We might see, unfortunately, some sort of step back because of the injury. Doesn't mean it will be permanent, but we, we could see something like that. But no matter what, he's still... Put in the work. I have nothing but respect for the work. It, assuming, assuming I'm important, and any of those words got to him, the mindset is uh, piss off, put his head down, headphones in, and just got back to the lab. Is pretty much what I saw out of him. I'm not taking credit for that. I'm just saying, like, I'm trying to articulate how like that mindset was, where it's like he just worked and he he figured it out. But no, we, we, I, I just give him a little bit of a little bit of crap because it's it's funny how little charisma hockey players have, like as a whole. I know <laughs> they're it's just a wet noodle. I hate it. I well, it comes from the top down, right? Like it, if you want to talk about something that Gary Bettman's done wrong, um, because people constantly harp on him about growing the game, I think silencing players. Uh, I think that was a bad thing. I do agree with probably facing fines uh, for players who are undermining, like, potential things. Like, I don't think that's probably healthy. Like, let's say you're undermining, uh, you know, you're Connor McDavid and you're saying, oh, my coach sucks, right? Not a good look. Don't want that. Not professional. Yeah. But if you're saying, uh, like, uh, a perfect example is uh, something that we happened to us. Uh, Trevor Zegras, that post-game interview, that that was some BS that Jay Beagle did to, um, God, I'm drawing a blank on his name, the the sniper for them, uh, for the Anaheim Ducks, who got beat up by Jay Beagle. And that post-game interview of him being unhappy about that, I think that's good for the game. I think that that, that, that sparks controversy, um, and that's something that... A lot of people, it, it might be polarizing, but it's something that people really like. They like to see that truth. They, I know a lot of people respected Zegris for his comments. Even though I disagreed with them, I think that was really good of him to voice that, that opinion. And I hope that the next generation of players have that ability to uh, voice an opinion like that, if that makes sense. Basically, the... I agree, but just basically to kind of hopefully, you know, put down what you're putting, what you're putting up, it's... Criticism, a okay. I, I hate the whole like, oh, you can't criticize the officiating or whatever. Criticism mm -hmm. is fine. For example, uh, you know, it's like you, you lost five to three, and it's like you know, I feel like you know, we lost a lot of momentum because there was a lot of really you know tic tac calls. I feel like that's fair. I yeah. feel like what's not fair is uh, these zebras are blind out there, or uh, my head coach is is an idiot, or uh, anything that that. Sean Avery would say basically if it's criticism yeah. if you're saying it in a professional way even if you're frustrated I think it's fine if you're just being an ass I think that's where fines are okay yep yep agreed absolutely agreed I don't know how we got here my ADHD <laughs> brain has has forgotten let me back it up before I run out of time I just want to okay. go back on that on that Garland thing because that, that really obviously that's right disclosure he was my favorite player but it Bill Armstrong from almost day one rubbed me the wrong way the same way that Chica in retrospect rubbed me the wrong way because look what Chica did to some of his veterans he bought out yep. uh, Anton Vermette he essentially just sent Z to the AHL he essentially bench Z even though if you yep. look at that damn roster you cannot find even four defensemen that were better than Z, even at that point in his career that year, they should have just let him finish Z, it out. Z for everybody is Zabinic McCulloch, uh, and I agree with that. That it was obviously his final year; like he made it pretty apparent, and they they AHL'd him. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, a little bit of a disservice. It's one thing to be James Neal, and you're on, unfortunately, a good team, and you've gotten pushed to the AHL. It's another thing to be on a bad team, and that team is putting you in the A. I think that's that's some BS. Especially when he still had the ability to play the way he did, because he was still, like, even at that point, good. Good, you know, probably, what, second pairing? Yeah, uh, he, at least at least you could put him on a third pair. Like, mm -hmm. you could find space for him. And, and it wasn't and like there was... Met, I was going to say, is, it, there, there, it wasn't like there were kids that needed to play either. It mm -hmm. wasn't... But we had the roster <laughs> spaces for those kids, for Connor Murphy and 
I yeah. think Stone might have still been on the team or he might have got traded that year, but the roster space was already there. It was just asinine. It, it was it brought me the wrong way. Yeah. Vermette was our best face off guy. Same thing with like how Strom was one of our best face off guys whenever they moved on from him. So like that's a real good way to rub someone the wrong way and thankfully how good that trade was, it made up for a lot of it, but it still does not take away the criticism of you should have called Connor and said, hey, you know, we, we want you here, but we, we're exploring different trade options. We want, you know, we were interested in trading you. Um, it's business. I, Connor is a professional. Uh, he was even talking about, you know, he would, he wasn't asking for Keller money. He mm-hmm. didn't want to, you know, he didn't want superstar money. He just wanted that commitment and, they did him dirty the same way that Z or for, cause it wasn't like Vermette went to a Stanley cup contender. He went to Anaheim that year and Anaheim wasn't a playoff team that year. I don't think, or they were, like I think they were, seed. no, I think they, no, they, I think... they were a low seed. Oh, were they? Yeah. They, they, I think at highest okay. they were seventh that year. Cause it wasn't even like they went to like a cup contending team. Unlike when they traded him, he won his cup in Chicago and came back. I, I didn't mind that, but like, I just, those things, especially starting off, just in case there's a small chance BA ever watches our stuff, first impressions, you only get one. And it's like, the I don't yep. care what the logic was. I don't care how good that trade was. Obviously, I've, I've forgiven now because he's done a good job. But those first impressions rubbing people the wrong way, you know. Got to be careful. have to, got to be careful. Yep. Gotta be careful. I, I appreciate you for helping me rain me in there. I, I lost there. Appreciate <laughs> yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just it, he's got to be smart with it. That's all there is to it. But uh, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Do we want to? We, we'll, we'll quickly give our our picks. How about this? We'll quickly give our picks on who's winning the Stanley Cup this year, as the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Colorado Avalanche are in the Stanley Cup Finals. How are you calling this? Tampa and six. Um, uh, I, I have some very negative opinions towards Colorado. I don't like a lot of their fans. They're very toxic to me personally, especially in 2020. I hated that playoff series, so it made me despise the team. And on top of that, if Darcy Kemper would have just kept his mouth shut, we could have got more value from him. I don't care if you want to leave. Don't tell a publication or say out loud you will not re-sign your contract. Just, hey, hey, BA, do, do you mind trading me? Just you know, slip a little note to him because I wanted Alex Newhook. So... Disclosures, personal vendettas, Tampa and sex. <laughs> Going Colorado and five. You know what's funny about that? My gut says it's either going to be a long series or borderline sweep. Yep. But I'm just going to say Tampa and sex anyway. <laughs> I think I think that it's Colorado's year. I bet it against them at the beginning of the start of this playoffs, and I have a good friend in, in Colorado who I – May or may not. I, I I made a bet with him back in the playoff bubble that whoever's team won in the playoff bubble, uh, we would go to uh, their city to hang out. And then the pandemic got much worse and everything started locking down. So I haven't been able to to hold up my end of the bargain to him. Matter of fact, funny enough, he came to my wedding, so I still won. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, he... he he uh he told me he's like oh you're really betting against my uh my abs this year and i went yep and then they they started sweeping teams and i went shouldn't have done it not betting against (laughs) not betting against the abs this year i am not going to do it i think that it's not going to be a sweep by no means i i know for a fact it will not be a sweep for the colorado colorado avalanche (laughs) because the tampa bay lightning are too good they are too veteran uh, they will find a, a way to win a game 1-0, but I don't think they can match the speed that Colorado has ha- had, and uh, I think that they are getting tired. Could be wrong, but three peats are very hard because of just pure amount of hockey that you played. I want Colorado to fail. But the problem is I can't win either way because my, my, my joy was laughing they couldn't make it out of the second round. Even if they would have lost to Edmonton, how can you laugh at a team for making the Final Four? Even if they lose in the Cup Final, how can you laugh at a team for losing in the Cup Final? So it's like, yep. no matter what, I don't win. But at the very least, if we can deny Colorado a Cup, I can still look at them and say my team has a chance to win a Cup before your team. 
Yeah. I, I want whatever small victory I can get because every other joy in my life, thanks Phoenix Suns and Arizona Rattlers, losing to both Tucson and Northern Arizona in the same damn year, so I don't have that meme anymore. All my joys in life are gone. Just, I have to cheer for Tampa, and I don't like Tampa. I used to like Tampa, then I heard a lot of their fans saying the Coyotes should relocate, and I'm like, you're in a worse spot than Arizona. Anyway, yep. <laughs> I have personal vendettas, there's my disclosure. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like Tampa and us should be locking arms right now in being Sunbelt teams. If there are f- Tampa fans telling us to relocate, uh, you need to take a long look in the mirror because that same criticism can get chucked at you next. And it was for years. When, yep. they, when they had their, their struggles, before, I think it was just after the little Caballé years, you can't tell me there was an oh, move Tampa. But then again, I'm going for... To be fair, I'm going to assume uh, those were likely uh, the the people that jumped on the bandwagon and are just jackasses in general. I'm going to assume. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt because I have to be a Lightning fan, and I, I guess it's fitting because my my custom A or A- A- Z Sports guy a Bolts jersey is sitting over here and it's going to get a lot of use over the next couple of weeks. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that was another good episode. That was episode 12 of the Desert Moon Hockey Podcast. I'm going to once again beg for a like, a subscription, a follow on whatever platform you're listening to us on. I'd really appreciate it. It would go a long way. Uh, You know, e-begging is the new thing. I've heard that that's the new trend, so I'm making it. I'm going to follow the trend. I'm not a trendsetter. I'm a trend follower, so I'm following the trend. Uh, aside from that, I think we did a good job. I also see the mustache has disappeared, and I'm disappointed. <laughs> but hey, hey, hey! It lined up as soon as I shaved that stash. That video blew up. So oh, the okay. stash cast was helping, but then mm-hmm. as soon as I got rid of the stash, it was like it, picture any sort of illicit substance that would be injected. That's what happened to our channel. There you go. All right. Thank you so much for listening slash watching. We will see all of you friends next week.